off. Um, so welcome to, you know, whatever numbers fireside chat this is, year two and a half. And uh, a pleasure to have uh, the Berkeley team with, with me. So I obviously was just kidding. These guys have been phenomenal partners of mine over the years, um, both at this company and other companies. Um, really enjoy them as human beings as well. So it's a pleasure to have them on this call. Uh, we're going to be going through and talking about stop loss and group captives um, and, and all the details around with it. So with us as well is Mr. Donald Lee, who is. Uh, also very well versed in, in the captive space and in all things reference space pricing. So great group of people on this call. Uh, I'm Heath Potter, Chief Growth Officer for Shipstreet Health. So pleasure to have you guys here. And with that, let me turn it over to the Berkeley team to introduce themselves and then we'll get this thing going. Hey, I'll start, Heath. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. This is Jim Hoyt. I'm the Chief Growth Officer here at Berkeley. We are uh, super grateful for the opportunity to spend some time with you all on the fireside chat uh, series here. So looking forward to the discussion uh, and I'll turn it over to Sean Lanter. Yep, thanks, Jim. Uh, so as uh, Jim mentioned, I'm Sean Lanter. I'm Vice President of Captive Business Development for Berkeley in the central US and I'm located in Kansas City. Jeff? Yep, thanks, thanks, Sean. This is Jeff Kanzer. I am the VP of Captive Business Development on the Eastern side of the country and uh, looking forward to our chat. Mike. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Mike Kaze, VP of Captive Business Development out of Phoenix, and I run to West, the Rockies, to the Pacific, to Alaska and Hawaii. Pleasure to meet you all. Thank you. Mr. Lee. Hi, everybody. I'm Donald Lee. I'm with Six Degrees Health, uh, Senior Vice President of Strategy and Underwriting, and I've been here around four and a half years and spent a lot of time with these Berkeley guys. Very, very knowledgeable group of people. Uh, uh, around stop loss and healthcare risk and captives. So looking forward to the conversation. All right, All right let's get this thing going. Um, you know, I think the, the topic around captives continues to grow um, and to the participation in these types of, uh, of organizations. So I'm, I'm familiar with Berkeley. Uh, I'm not sure the rest of the audience knows, uh, you know, who you guys are. They probably, some do, some don't. Can you give us a, a little bit of information on who you guys are and, and what you're doing out there? Yeah, uh, Heath, I'll, I'll, I'll put that one here for the group. Um, again, appreciate uh, the, the introductions here. And uh, yeah, let's tell you a little bit about our organization here to get started. We're, we are Berkeley Accident Health. We're part of the WR Berkeley Corporation. That's our, our parent company. I think in, important to take out of that is just an incredibly financial sound uh, organization. Um, great reputation in terms of a risk taker, um, been all around for a long time, and so we're really about stability. Um, as, it re as it relates to our world and what we'll all talk about today, um, Berkeley a &H is at its core, of, we're a medical stop loss company, I and mean, that's, our, that's our foundation, that's how we've built our organization. But our niche and, and sort of our personality, what we're known for in the marketplace is what we're going to talk about today, the medical stop loss group captive space. And um, it is a really exciting time in this marketplace right now. That's why I think the timing is perfect for, for this discussion. We've seen tremendous growth over, uh, over the years here, and um, we're really kind of calling it an, an empowered marketplace where, where people want to take control. They, they recognize that... Um, all the challenges they face, uh, they, the, the more control they have, the more equipped they become to, to address those challenges. And so the captive really gives them the ability to do that. And from Berkeley's point of view, that's what we really see ourselves as helping people build their own captive programs, helping people launch and kind of get to the vision that they're hoping to get to as it relates to risk management for their particular um, set of, of customers, whether it's a broker or a set of employers and association group. Um, you know, we've got a plan and we don't, we don't, we don't need the, the fully insured marketplace to tell us what to do. We want to take control of these things and do it our way. And so from Berkeley's point of view, our model is designed to help them, um, kind of meet that vision that, that they're looking for. Um, we're, you know, we certainly pride ourselves in being a, a high integrity organization. You can see some of these stats on the line here that's supported financially, but I also think really important for this space is you know, making sure people understand exactly what our role is, uh, making sure that we're fully transparent on all the cost items that go back and forth. 
Uh, that's a big part of the commitment we have to to our partners. Um, if you're going to take control of the dollars, you better know where all the dollars are going. And um, and for sure, that's that's a big part of, of the of the Berkeley uh, of the Berkeley value story. Um, everything is is wrapped around a Berkeley life and health stop loss policy. So again, at the end of the day, where I started was we're a stop loss carrier. We're a stop loss carrier that specializes in captives. But at the end of the day, we have an you know an excellent uh, stop loss policy that supports it. And that's really what I think the foundation of this business is self-funded employers in an environment to help manage and control the volatility of self-funding. That's why they join the captive and they do it uh, with a stop loss a partnership and carrier that's going to help be there for them when, when those troubled times come along the way. So, um, so that's a little bit about Berkeley from a personality standpoint. We are, um, we do like to have a good time. It's a, it's, I think a commonality of, of our friends with six degrees. We like to have fun in this marketplace and, uh, Certainly a lot of stability our team has been in place for a long time, as as has the Six Degrees team. And so uh, we share a, a couple of those traits there. This is a, There's a lot of complexity in this marketplace, and let's have a little fun while we're doing it. And uh, let's make sure that people know who we are and, and what we're about in, in the space. So uh, so that's a little bit about our, our story there, Heath, as we lead into where, where, what, what the captive is all about. Yeah, thanks, Jim. Mike, it looked like you had something you wanted to say. I mean, as uh, appreciated, Heath, as, as Jim mentioned, you know, we are transparent to a fault and a great reputation that we have in the marketplace is, is that all 200 associates plus associates of accident health are approachable and uh, for any type of situation to get on the phone to have conversations with any of us in learning the captive business and, you know, having existing customers talking to um, underwriting, talking to program managers, account managers, all direct, all of us are available to help out pre-sale, post-sale. Okay. Um, so one thing I, I totally botched on the introduction to is if we have to give the, uh, the, the Zoom overview. Uh, so this, you know, fireside chat for anybody that's new to them are, are designed for kind of a, a, an ongoing dialogue, less presentation, more question and answer type arrangement and that includes the audience so if you have questions um feel free to use that q a toggle or button on the bottom of your zoom screen click that should bring up a screen you can type in a question and i'll work those into the uh to the broadcast as we go through so um and i think most people can see those so keep them clean uh you may have an admissibility on that but um you know remember that everybody's watching so Thank you guys for that introduction. Thanks for using the QA. Um, I'd prefer you not to use the, the chat section though, because that makes it hard for me to track. Okay. Um, in a captive space, how do you go about dividing the risk for employers? So, Heath, I will jump on this one. Um, all right. So, this slide right here, for those that have worked with Berkeley, you've seen this ad nauseum. I've been with the company now for 10 years, and I think this was the first visual I ever had from Berkeley around, you know, captive risk share and risk transfer. Um, we include this with every proposal that we run. We include it, you know, as, as part of our aggregate captive reporting packages. And, and basically, this lays out and illustrates how this all works, right, financially and, and the risk transfer. Um, you can see here it says retain share transfer. So, you know, as Jim mentioned, Everything we're talking about here with the group stop loss captive starts with each individual employer becoming self-funded or uh, if they were coming out of a full insured chassis um, and purchasing a stop loss policy from Berkeley, right? So every individual employer has the ability to take on whatever self-funded risk they want to. Um, you know, larger employers can buy higher spec deductibles and smaller employers can buy lower spec deductibles. So in this example here, you can see in the green box, it says individual um, $25,000. $25, That's the individual stop loss deductible. Then this example that this employer would be purchasing. This is probably a you know, 50 to 100 life employer group, right? So they would also look to purchase an aggregate coverage from Berkeley um, from a stop loss perspective. So we would you know, give them a maximum liability for the smaller utilization and frequency claims. So the, the self-funded retention in that box is, is outside of any group sharing risk, right? That, that, that's individual employers taking on the smaller claims from a self-funded perspective, no risk share involved. The blue and the gold layers are, are stop loss premium, right? So that would be premium 
that's captured to cover all the claims above that $25,000 deductible and for any claims that exceeded the aggregate, right? The employer is going to pay premium uh, for stop loss policy to cover that risk. If an employer was just self-funded in the commercial market, all of that premium would go to the stop loss carrier, whether it's Berkeley or whoever else, right? But we are talking about a group stop loss captive. So what we're basically doing is we're allowing multiple employers to take on a defined layer of that stop loss risk that the stop loss carrier would normally take on. So that blue layer right there illustrates what that captive shared risk layer would be. So in this example, it's basically saying that all individual claims or catastrophic claims above $25,000 would be a liability at that captive layer, okay? So from 25,000 to the next 225,000 per individual claimant, that would be a loss at the captive layer. Because of that, that risk that the captive's taking on, we're gonna put a significant amount of the actual stop loss premium you know, into that captive to account for that risk or that exposure that employer is putting onto the captive. And we're gonna do that for all of the participating employer groups. Um, so essentially allows them to, to pool their premium together, stop loss premium that normally would go to the commercial carrier into now the captive insurance company and allows them to participate at that, that set level. So there's a couple of advantages there, right? It, it, there's a financial opportunity for them because if the losses at that blue layer stay below the premium that's collected and there's underwriting profit there, that now is an opportunity that, or for a distribution to go back to the membership. So they can participate financially in the stop loss through the captive vehicle. So there's that aspect of it, but then there's also the aspect of the captive creating, it's, it's, a, it's a volatility mitigation tool, right? So it allows, you know, from an underwriting perspective, it allows the ability to pull together uh, a larger amount of stop loss premium to, to make the risk more predictable. You know, so we're leveraging the law of large numbers and critical mass when we're underwriting and evaluating, you know, the individual stop loss for all the membership. There's a, there's a pooling component that's now included that's going to create some, some predictability and stability for each of these smaller to mid-market employers. Now, ultimately, <clears throat> Berkeley is on the back end of the risk where it shows that gold layer there, all the claims that were to exceed $225,000 above the group spec deductible would be a liability for Berkeley. Right. We all know that there's a higher frequency of, you know, high six figure, seven figure claims out there. You know, we have some of these specialty drugs that are coming in at extremely high cost. You know, there's there's always unknown catastrophic risk that any group's going to look at. And even a captive wouldn't want to take on unlimited risk. And that's really where Berkeley is going to step in. And we would take the risk for those really, really high dollar catastrophic claims at that at that back end, um, which, again, kind of you know, just it, it reinforces the, the financial strength of Berkeley or whoever somebody's evaluating from a stop loss perspective, just to know that when, if those high dollar claims, you know, are to come in, they've got a really strong stop loss carriers and backstop there to help, you know, protect each individual plan's assets and provide an overall protection for the captive itself. So the ultimate goal here is we want, we want these employers to take risk at the appropriate level where it makes sense for them. Have each group individually take on that smaller self-funded risk for claimants, you know, under that specific deductible, give them a maximum liability, share in the risk as a group at this blue captive layer, and then ultimately transfer the, the unpredictable, really high dollar catastrophic risk back over to Berkeley on the back end. All right. Thank you, Sean. So a question came in. Um, this is... Uh... This could be a big one, so don't don't get too uh, sidetracked on it. But what are the pros and cons of captives versus self-funding? And I think there could be a some clarification that needs to be made there as well. But I'll let you guys take it. Um, I, I guess I'll I'll jump in there. So pros and cons of self-funding versus a captive. So so you know, self-funding and a captive is still self-funding, right? So every group yeah. still buying, purchasing stop loss, right? They're going to take on that that layer of self-funded risk in the aggregate, you know, under the aggregate, whether they're in a captive or traditionally self-funded in the, in the commercial market. 
Um, the big difference in a huge part of the value proposition is, you know, I, I alluded to it, you know, at a high level earlier, but, you know, there's, there's a financial opportunity component associated with the captive, where if the captive risk pool, risk pool itself, you know, performs favorably, you know, there's, there's a financial opportunity associated with that. Um, so there's that component of it. There's also the component of uh, the captive being kind of a shock absorber to a certain extent when it comes to creating predictability and stability come renewal time from a stop loss perspective. Any, you know, especially smaller to mid-market employer groups, you know, they're not going to generate a significant amount of stop loss premium, right? So if there are ongoing risk, you know, that would exceed the group specific deductible, you know, that's going to create some volatility come renewal time, right? And with the captive, you can leverage a larger pool premium, right? There's, there's, they can take on a little bit more of the known risk, create some temperance for every group, mitigate that volatility of, you know, significant increases. We're really looking to band everybody more tightly together within the captive program, right? So that, that's, a, that's a huge component to the value proposition, especially for these smaller men market groups. Um, the one definite component to consider from a, a risk perspective is that if, if an employer joins a captive, um, they do need to post collateral for the captive program, right? Uh, the, the captive is an insurance company, and so it needs to be appropriately reserved. So every group would need to uh, come up with some non-premium funding to make sure that the, the, the insurance company, the captive, is fully funded and reserved appropriately. And that's a financial component that, that isn't in play if a group is traditionally self-funded through the commercial market. So I'm going to pause there and see if, uh, you know, Jim, Jeff, Mike, you guys have anything additionally you want to add as well. You know, I'd, yeah. I'd ask you, Sean, that it's a great question on, you know, pros and cons and, and the whole the whole sort of, you know, topic that we're hitting today is is the concepts versus reality, right? What what are what 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 were the concepts that were talked about in the captive space when all this stuff was forming 10 plus years ago, certainly from Berkeley's point of view? And then what's the reality of the business? And I think you hit some good ones there. And I think we're going to hit some of those as we go on. But you know, I'd add to the pros, you know, from a, from an anecdotal standpoint, if you're a self-funded employer, you're, you know, you're, you're a solo artist. You've got your broker advisor helping guide you along the path, but, but ultimately you're, you know, you're making decisions for your plan, um, you know, just, just based on, on, on decisions for you as a business and, and within the captive space to be surrounded by a bunch of other employers that um, are, are seeking to accomplish many of the same things, but are willing to collaborate and share and bring, bring to you things that, that work for them, that, that might work for you, things that didn't work for them that, that you can try to avoid. I think that collaboration and that sort of co cohesive approach of, of a number of employers participating with the same goal in mind to better manage risk, that's a huge pro and something that, again, it's anecdotal. It, it won't show up on, a, on an ROI or a results slide here, but without a question, um, you know, employers that have been part of our programs for a long time, that's one of their biggest takeaways is the ability to spend time with other employers and, and, and collaborate on the challenges that they're, that, that they're facing. I think that's a, a significant advantage and a, and a move in the, in the right direction for, for the captive versus traditional self funding. I don't know if Jeff, you were gonna add something there too? Yeah, I, I'll be the negative Nelly in the room and talk about the con. The one con that I really see is if you're an employer and you think you're going to run well every single year, probably the captive's not for you because then you should just go it alone. Because at that point, as part of the captive community, you know, you're, when you're running really well, your increase is probably going to be higher than if you go out to the open market and shop, shop it and get that low rate because you're a good risk. But what the captive is trying to provide, as Sean mentioned, is that shock absorber. And when you have those bad years, you want it to be more or less tempered. And I think that's what the captive creates. So if you feel you're going to run well every single year, you're probably not the right group for a captive. I, I was going to add, I mean, it's yes. kind of about, it's about pushing the stop loss carriers a little bit further from the risk and allowing the smaller, smaller plan sponsors to share in this. You see it right here. A smaller plan, they can only buy a $25,000 individual spec, but they can share in the risk up to 225. And so if you can do that over time, that's obviously going to bring more dollars down to you. But when you're standing on your own and something big happens, it's it's not as easy to navigate some of those those issues that come across when you're standing on. But being self-funded is definitely a big step in the right direction either way.
All right. So we got a lot of questions coming in. Um, I may not take these in order because I'll try and line them up with some of the slides that I know we have coming here. Um, but one of them is about, you know, the, the size of a captive or, or the segment that you might want to look at for group stop loss or captive. So let, let's, let's address that one and I'll, I'll blend these other ones in as we go. So, you know, is there a group segment that's best for, for stop loss captives? You know, and, and kind of what are you expecting for growth in these areas? Yep, yep. I can take that question. And, and as you look at the slide there, it'll help uh, guide us along. But really, at, from Berkeley's perspective, we've always looked at the uh, 50 to 500 life market as really being the sweet spot for, for, for captives. Because what we're trying to create in the captive space is the uh, law of large numbers and try to create temperance in that, in that group's self-funded plan. And 92% or more of groups that are 5,000 lives or greater self-fund. And the reason they self-fund is they know the rewards of being self-funded. They know they get temperance. They know they get control, flexibility, and cash flow. What we're trying to do in the captive space is take these 50 to 500 life groups and make them look like a 5,000 life entity and create some temperance for them so that they can reap the rewards of being self-funded. We have seen in our market actually that when we first started, we didn't see too many groups over 500 lives. I think as the increase of the seven figure claims takes place, we are seeing the number of groups over 500 lives increase. We are seeing 750 and 1,000 life groups wanting to be part of a captive to create some temperance when they are stricken with that seven-figure claim. Um, with regards to growth, if, as you look at this slide, you know, we see tremendous growth. If, if you look at the circled area, the 50 to 199, which we think is the, the primo group segment for this, there's still 70% employers that are fully insured that could reap the rewards of being self-funded. And even in the 200 to 1,000 life market, we're still looking at about 40% that are not um, self-funded that we feel could reap the rewards and the advantages of being self-funded. Okay. Um, let's see, I'm trying to think through what would be the best question to add in here but you just want to um, fire, fire away on any of them we'll take any any direction yeah let me i'm just trying to line them up with the slides so we don't get too far off but uh, how many employers typically participate in a given captive and how are they chosen um i'll i'll yeah I'll, I'll jump on that one and everybody can chime in um so berkeley's writing Stop loss over 45 different captive programs today. So we've got a lot of different risk pools out there that have a that are made up, uh, you know, in very different manners, right? Some are some are heterogeneous, some are homogeneous. They range in size significantly. The, the smallest program we have probably has you know five employer groups and a thousand lives. Um, largest we have is is closing in on 200 em employers. So we're all over the place. Um, I would say, you know, if you looked at our, what we call our open captive programs, uh, which are public, you know, quote unquote, public captives, where you have multiple producers, consultants driving business to them across the country, you know, those are probably averaging 50 to 60 employer groups um, at any given point. Um, but then we have basically 40 closed or private label captives out in the marketplace as well. Right, and maybe a, a consultant that's coming to us, maybe a TPA, maybe an association. There's, there's a lot of different producer partners, um, and those you're probably on average a little bit smaller. Um, and we do have a few slides in here that kind of hit on, you know, what is the critical mass you need to create some predictability when it comes to the risk pool. But basically, what we found is, and Jeff kind of hit on it, you know, you 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 have self-funded groups in the commercial market that are a thousand plus lives that feel like they're large enough to take risk on their own, 
right? So what do we feel like from a group captive perspective, we need to create predictability. And, um, you know, what we found is you don't need hundreds of groups to create that predictability. Really, you know, if you, you've got a program that's, you know, uh, you know, 10 groups, you can, you can have a high level of confidence that you're, you're going to have a good chance to perform um, at, a, at a pretty solid level, right? And the more that it grows, you know, the more predictable the risk pool becomes. But, but truly, I mean, we, we, we find, you know, producer partners that, that feel like they're accomplishing what they want to accomplish, you know, when they get to five groups in a thousand lives. There is somewhat of a diminishing return, right? You know, we, you reach a certain critical mass and you're just not going to become any more predictable, right? Like it's just, you know, you, you reach a certain point where you, you kind of know what the risk pool is going to do. It becomes credit, cred, credible. So I think that's why, because we, you know, we have the analytics and the data and the results to, to back it up. We have a lot of these programs that are in that, you know, 15 to 20 employer space. And, uh, and again, you know, if you look at our overall book of business, um, our captive programs, 75% of the time, they perform better than expected, right? 10% of the time they're hitting right on the break even point. 15% of the time they run higher than expected. Actuarially, 50% of the time they should, you know, do better or worse than break even. But, uh, you know, they perform better than average, you know, more times than not. And our risk pools across the board are not hundreds of lives. They are, you know, in that 50 to 50, you know, employer life range. I jumped on that one, guys. Anybody else want to add anything? You did a good job. Yeah. Great job, Sean. Nailed it. So there's a couple of questions coming in about RDP. I think our next slide um, is about, about reference-based pricing and captives. So I'll, I'll rattle off a couple of the questions. One says, uh, please explain your relationship with Six Degrees and do you have captive cells that are just RDP? So I'll hit the first piece of this and you guys can add to it. But uh, Alina, if you want to go to the next slide, I think it's about reference based. So we we participate um, and do reference based pricing on on some of uh, Berkeley's groups. We also have a payment integrity product that's uh, been incorporated into uh, an option through Berkeley as well. So you know that's the probably the clean and simple answer there. And then in terms of do they have a capture cell that's just RVP? I'll, I'll turn that over to uh, to the Berkeley guys to talk about. Right. So thank you, Heath. I'll take this one. So RVP being close, near, dear to my heart is, is that the, uh, yeah, Berkeley does have a program specifically for groups uh, with RVP. And as Sean mentioned, is, is like it's part of the 45 plus programs that we have in place right now. And, uh, you know, truth be told is, is that the experience of the RVP cap by its very nature is of great performance over the time that it's been in existence. Mm -hmm. So um, one of the reasons why we, you know, enjoy the relationships with employers uh, that are with six degrees and RVP in general is that they already belong into a, a small niche of, you know, thinking outside the box and trying to curb their claims. So take an RVP strategy as the first measure in that step, and then looking at, you know, captive Berkeley captive as the next step. And why do they want to do that? Is because they have a want to have a sense of community and ownership, being part with employers that think alike, want to have the same outcomes, want to put risk strategy, uh, risk management strategies, cost containment strategies, in addition to RVP in place to have you know, a long-term relationship with one carrier, enjoy renewals that are um, manageable and attract and retain employees at the end of the day. So um, one of the question was, is that are we bound by, you know, TPAs and PBMs? You know, we are Switzerland when it comes to that. The consultant drives the conversation as to what TPA to put in place, what PBM to put in place um, what, uh, in addition to RBP. Um, we are uh, huge proponents of direct narrow and, and center of uh, excellent networks. In addition to that, member advocacy, care coordination, communication, and basically engaging with employers that just don't, you know, sign on the dotted line and just wait nine months later for the next renewal to come in and saying, okay, now we're going to up the deductible again to manage the increase. So that is, you know, 
employers and consultants that are in the RVP space and with six degrees are uh, definitely along the line of Berkeley captive. So there's a kind of a pointed question here, and I, I think you probably answered it, but let's just ask it. Um, do you have captives where in order to be allowed into it, you have to implement RBP or other cost containment strategies? Uh, you know, there are two, yeah. two, two different thoughts, right? Is, is that in talking to consultants, you know, in the territories is that some start out with, you know, dipping their toe into the captive, right? Starting to work the captive and then implementing RBP, you know, maybe a year or two later, you know, as everybody gets accustomed to being self-funded, if they're, you know, a hundred live case that's never been self-funded, now we get you know, we manage it and then we put in RVP or RVP is already in place and now we go into captive. So we can we can flex both ways. I'll, I'll add to yeah. that too. And, and he, well, go ahead, Sean. No, you take it. Well, no, I was just going to say um, in regards specifically to RVP, we do have a program where an employer has to be, you know, they have to have Medicare type reimbursements for facility claims. Right, there has to be a percentage of Medicare. Um, so we launched that program back in 2015 because we had employers that were utilizing RVP strategies that were in other captives that Berkeley had where not everybody was doing that. And their brokers came to us and said, hey, would you guys be open to creating a new program specific for employers doing RVP? They're the only ones that can come in, you know, for facility claims they have to do and they have to have a Medicare reimbursement methodology. And we said, yeah, let's do it. Um, so we launched it back in 2015. It is a, it's a quote unquote public or open captive program that, that's open to producer partners across the country. You fast forward to where we're at today, you know, it, it again is kind of in that, that average of our open program number. It's got 50 to 60 employer groups in it. Um, so it's seen nice growth, you know, over the, the seven, eight year period. But the really cool thing about it is, Every year since inception, I mean, knock on wood here, it has driven a, a very nice distribution back. It has performed extremely well financially. And again, we have to be competitive with our stop loss on the front end in order to get groups to join, right? You have to be competitive on the front with your stop loss. But then if there's an opportunity to, to kind of, you know, participate at that next level, you know, from a stop loss perspective, you know, an employer looks at it from a risk reward perspective and says, okay, it's a, you know, there's, there's a significant opportunity that this is a high performing captive. I may have a chance to get some of those dollars back. And oh, by the way, it's got that whole predictability volatility mitigation story to it as well. So, I mean, really we kind of, when we're having conversations, any group that's doing RBP in the standalone commercial market, you know, should be looking to potentially join this captive because of its historical track record. Now you always have the, uh, the asterisk there, you know, historical losses don't necessarily dictate future returns. And that's, that's actually absolutely true because um, we're truly pricing everything to break even. But I think having a captive that is built around RBP is the glue or foundation and the fact that it's performed so well really puts a spotlight on the overall financial impact that RBP has. And stop loss carriers can't necessarily give all of the credit for it financially that it brings to the equation for employers. And when you have a stop loss risk pool built around it, and now they get to participate like the stop loss carrier, you know, historically would, that's pretty powerful. It's really powerful, actually. All right. Um, do, do you guys feel like stop loss captains provide stability? Yes, I, I'll take that question and Heath, the simple answer is yes. Um, what I will tell you, the long winded answer is, is that we were posed this question probably about 10 years ago at one of our broker forums at our symposium. And at the time we really didn't have a very credible book of business, even being pioneers in the industry, we really didn't have enough data to really confirm that. So what we did was we did case studies. We looked at individual groups and, and try to see the individual groups if we could show the, um, the reduction of volatility was taking place. Fast forward to today, we now have grown. We have a book of business that we can go back and look at how everything um, progressed through the years. And what this slide actually shows, 
as Jim had mentioned from the beginning, we are first and foremost a stop loss carrier. So we do have a stop loss book of business along with our captive book of business. And what this slide shows you is two things. Number one is if you look at the bottom, it shows the average rate increase for both books of business for the same time frame. And so you do see that the captive book of business has shown lesser rate increases. But what we really are excited about is actually looking at the picture. And what you're seeing there is that blue line. That blue line is actually more like a hill. And what that is, is that's the traditional stop loss. And that actually is showing you that as the rate increases for the book go back and forth, they're really spread out over a very wide range. That's why the hill is there. But if you look at the orange line, the orange line actually is a mountain. And that is because like we thought it would do, the increases are more concentrated uh, right towards the middle. And everybody seems to fall in that middle. That's why it creates that uptick in there. So based on our data that we've had for 10 plus years, we do show that the captive has performed better than our traditional book of business. And also that the rate increases for the captives have been more concentrated. There's not the wide ranges. There's a lot more temperance, which is what we've been selling really from the beginning, even though we didn't have the data to back it up. Okay. Uh, there's a couple of questions I think fit into this section here. So, you know, you've talked a lot about, you know, captive performing well, but what, what happens if the captive performs poorly? If claims are more money than brought in, how much additional premium collateral can be called from the vendor? Is there an unlimited liability? Let me take, I'll take that since I've been talking. I've already taken a lot of the air out of the room. Um, what I would tell you is, is they do have, this is a fully funded product. Um, it does have a cap. So your collateral is your reserving requirement. That is your risk for this risk-taking entity. So when you exhaust your collateral, and as a, as a captive, you exhaust your collateral, we have what's called a program aggregate on top of that. That is a Berkeley product. And again, remember what Berkeley stands for. Berkeley is A plus AM best rated Fortune 500 company. So we've got the financial backing that we back it up. So we do sometimes in competition, sometimes in our marketing, we do hear someone say, oh, I was in a captive. It was a property casualty captive. And they kept doing assessments and they kept asking for more and more money. That's not this product. This product is fully funded. There is a, a max cost for each employer. And once they reach that cost, the actual um, Berkeley actually with our program aggregate picks up the rest of the, the, the cost. How is that capitalization determined at the levels? I guess, I guess I would, when it comes to capitalization, I guess I would wanna make sure I understand what he's talking about or she's talking about capitalization. You know, we have a turnkey approach, um, a turnkey captive where there is no capitalization requirement. Um, that is something where um, we put together a couple of captives one in Bermuda, one in North Carolina that have already been capitalized. So there is very little cost to entry. The only really cost is the collateral, which is part of that risk that you requ that's required for being part of the captive. But we do a very much of a crawl, walk, run phase. And so the crawling is our turnkey. The walking is probably doing a third party. Um, both of those don't usually require too much capitalization requirements. But there is the run phase. And if you really take it captives to a further level, there would be a capitalization requirement because you're starting your own captive from the ground up. But really, most of what we see is in that turnkey approach and a little of the third party where there is really no capitalization requirement. And, and Heath, I'll just add if the question the question might be referring to, you know, capital as collateral, which Jeff hit there too. And it could, it could be, you know, it could be uh what capital does somebody have to put up in a form of collateral? And if that's the case, it's really just a function of the risk that you pose to the captive. So your, your stop loss premium is your, is your equivalent. Your stop loss premium is your risk. Think of it as what we develop for stop loss premium becomes what we expect for you to have in claims. And so a portion of that 
stop loss premium and a portion of that stop loss premium that, that seeds to the captive is that percentage that you would put up for collateral. Um, and so it's a fairly consistent process in terms of a max cost exposure. It's a very small amount. If, if an employer's, you know, thinking of their total healthcare spend, um, this the, the collateral for joining the captive might be in the you know three percent, four percent range uh, from what it posts there. So if it's if it's capital to start and build an insurance company called a captive, as Jeff said, our turnkey model is not much. If it's cap, if it's if the question was more on capital for collateral, uh, that's basically how that that component of it works. All right. So we've got about 16 minutes to go. A pretty good grouping with great questions and I think three more slides. So let's hit another slide. I think a couple of these questions are going to fall into that. And then we can hit some more questions up as we, we get towards the bottom of the hour here or the top of the hour. So um, does the size of a group captive matter? Yeah, and I'll I'll jump on this just for a second, Heath, and I might turn it over to to Jeff pretty quickly because I I hit on some of these things already. But this is just a good example to give you an idea around. Yes, you know where what how does size play into this when it comes to the overall group perspective, right? Um, how does this help mitigate exposure for each individual employer? And basically, you know what what this is saying here is, um, you know, if we have a captive program, a risk pool that has eleven members, twenty two hundred employee lives, you know what are the odds that they are going to run better than the maximum liability that the captive has? Okay. So if you kind of think about, you know, 120% loss ratio as being the maximum, that would be, you know, the, the premium seat in the captive plus that collateral, that reserve that Jeff and Jim were talking about, you know, what, what like, we've got a smaller program here. We only have 11 members, you know, is there like a 50% chance we're going to have a hundred percent collateral call because our cap is so small. And so we did a study on that and we basically ran it through, you know, Monte Carlo and our actuarial team and figured out um, that basically, I mean, there's a 90% chance that a program that has 11 members will run below that maximum liability. Right. So, you know, this is a smaller program. Um, and, and then above and beyond that, 75% of the time they run better than expected and expected is a hundred percent. Right. So, so again, we're, we're pulling together these statistics and these results so we can help educate our producer partners and the clients that are looking to join these programs to build up their confidence level. Right. And, and that's the beauty where we're at in the marketplace right now is there is proof of concept with everything that we're talking about here. You know, Jeff mentioned it earlier, five, six, seven years ago, we had an awesome story, you know, the, the marketplace in general, not only us, you know, not only Berkeley, but our competitors, everybody had a really good story, but there was no data there to support it. And now we've got some anal analytics and data like this to kind of, you know, prop up our, our value proposition and, and help the build that confidence level with the proof of concept. If you look at the next slide, um, that just kind of gives you, it'll give you an idea of, you know, growth and how that impacts these, these numbers. So if we go from 11 members to 20 members, 2,200 employee lives to 4,000, now all of a sudden there's a 95% chance that we're going to, you know, run below, you know, a, a collateral, 100% collateral call, right? So, and again, that is the worst case scenario, right? Again, 75% chance of running better than expected based off our overall book of, of business with, with 45 different programs. So the whole point of this is to basically say, yeah, from Berkeley's perspective, we've got some larger open captive programs that folks can plug into. They all have kind of a unique story tied to them. The RBP programs, one, we've got other ones that have kind of a different message, different risk management strategy. But if somebody wants to build something, you know, and have it, you know, private labeled exclusively for them, you know, it doesn't take 100 members, you know, to accomplish what you want to accomplish, you know, in regards to creating this predictability, stability for your your smaller to mid-market self-funded clients that are looking to do this. Um, so Jeff, I'll, I'll kick it over. Do you have any other thoughts? I'm not hitting on that. Yeah, the only thing I, the only thing I would add, which you you brought up earlier, is you know size does matter, but then bigger isn't always better. There does come a point when you get so big that you get the law of diminishing returns, where we're trying to create a sense of community. We're trying to make sure that the voice of the member is heard. And if you get too big, some of that gets diluted. And so the only thing we would just bring up to you is, you know, there is something to be said for creating that temperance, but sometimes there is a, 
a point where you just don't get much for adding all those extra lives to your captain. And and again, we're yeah. talking about here the, the 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 odds of having dipping into the collateral, right? Which the collateral, as Jim mentioned, is three to four percent of an employer's maximum liability. You know, we're basically saying, all right, there's a pretty small chance of that happening. But even if they do, you know, it's it's a pretty small percentage of the overall maximum liability. And there can be such situations where there could potentially be a collateral call at the captive layer, but then the individual employer and the captive runs phenomenally well with their self-funded retention, their aggregate, right? Where their self-funding claim, the smaller claims on their own, and they could still come out financially ahead, right? So that's the beauty of the whole way we're, we're structuring these programs is we're letting, you know, we're letting the members take risk in these different areas where, you know, you may run, you may run a little bit high in one area, but you may perform well in another. Um, so it gives them opportunity to win in a couple of different ways. All right. Thank you, guys. Um, let's get through. We got two slides to go, and then I'll leave us uh, about a minute for a question. I think if we can make that happen. But uh, if not, we can always answer these and send them <laughs> out. Um, in regards to cost, our group stop loss gap is expensive to start. Well, we we touched on it uh, earlier. You know, with Jeff and Jim, is is that the, the models that we can you know provide to a you know, a group of consultant. You know, we have our turnkey um, captive sales site there in um, Bermuda and in North Carolina. Um, we can go a third-party captive, where uh, the group can decide to build from the uh, ground up. So we can pivot uh, many different ways. Okay. Uh, on average, how much annual premium do you collect from each captive program on the book? I know that's kind of a, a broad question, probably has some variable to it, but I'll let you take a stab at it. Hmm. Trying to think of how, so the question maybe again, he, if, if, try, try the question and just make sure we answer it the right way too. Is it how much of the premium? Uh, it, it just, it was asking how you collect premium. I'm thinking maybe think of it along with how do you calculate it or, well, or how do you assess we, that? We could, I could say, Jim, I could just jump in. I guess our average premium case is about $350,000. Let's just say our average captive is 20, 25 lives. That's 20, 25 employers. That's six to $8 million. And we're seeding about 55%, at 55 to 60% on average to the captive. So if you do the math on six million dollars, you're seeding probably something close to four million dollars. Eight million, you're probably seeing something closer to five to five and a half. And that that changes. I mean, that's sort of the beauty on on this model. On this this slide that's up here, it actually is a good way to think about it. And that bottom right corner, we're talking about risk share model. Well, as an employer, you know, for, for, from Berkeley's point of view, you know, we don't we don't dictate what layer of risk a captive wants to take. If a captive is is has great performance and continues to grow and add members and wants to assume more risk at the captive layer then they go then then we certainly would support that and we'll give them the analysis to say hey good news your performance has been so good your growth has been so good why don't you move from a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar risk taking captive layer to a three hundred thousand dollar risk taking layer let's show you what that would have done for you go ahead and, and go down that road and so uh, under that sort of thinking then that percentage of the total premium that would go to the captive would would then increase because they're taking on more risk and Berkeley's taking on less risk. And I think that's a natural evolution of a of a good of a well run captive program is to find ways to assume more risk. That's that's the end game here: less insurance premium, more control over dollars. So there's a question in here: um, Are captives created, or do you guys have captives created to fit larger groups that may have current spec of three hundred thousand dollars? Yeah, um, I'll jump on that one. Uh, we do. I mean, it's interesting is, is this market's evolving. I think Jeff maybe had this earlier, but larger groups are coming to us interested in this. It, and it may not be because they feel like they need to come together to mitigate, you know, volatility, right? They're not looking at it from that angle. They're looking at it purely more from a financial efficiency perspective. Just knowing that, you know, if we can pay a dollar stop loss premium in the commercial market and we can pay the same dollar stop loss premium in a group captive, 
and that group captive has a great track record tied to it where, you know, the, the risk reward with the collateral versus the, you know, the risk of the collateral versus the reward of getting some dollars back, it, it just seems to make sense, right? Um, so we have larger groups looking at it. I mean, RB, our, our RBP caps is a great example of where we're seeing larger groups, you know, because of that mindset. But it's interesting, we are finding, you know, Berkeley, we, we kind of pride ourselves on being able to, you know, kind of help build out a risk pool. If there's a risk pool out there of 10 or 11 groups and they want to have their own captive program for whatever reason, whatever the motivation, we can help build something there, right? And so you do find these affinity groups out there that, that may be larger, right? Maybe a thousand plus lives. We have some of these opportunities where it's, you know, employers, a thousand to 10,000 lives. They're still purchasing stop loss. They're just purchasing at a much higher level for the individual deductibles. And then they can still take a, a, a layer of shared risk above and beyond that through the captive. Um, so if they're buying other stuff together already, this is just another product that they can kind of share risk in and purchase together. Um, you know, we're, we're seeing more of those opportunities just as kind of the, the snowball keeps building in this world of group stop loss captives and market segment in general. I mean, one thing to know that you showed on one of your first so slides, I mean, there's still 20% of the population over a thousand lives that's fully insured. So, so there's a long right. way for those people to go. And, and, and that's a big chunk of this country. So there's, there's a lot of steps that can be taken along the way to move yourself down this risk, risk spectrum, even if you're large. All right. Uh, Let's talk about why captives are so popular over the last decade. Um, what's the reason? So, so Heath, I'll, I'll sort of, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll take a swing at that and, and let the, let the group add in. It might tee up some of the questions, but I, I'd sort of come back thinking about that on the whole point of our session today, which was, you know, is it, what are the concepts versus the reality of this, of this whole thing? The concepts all are why the model has been so popular and the concepts are, does a captive give us more control over the financial components of, of insurance? Insurance is inefficient. When, when you're paying insurance premium, it's inefficient. There's all types of, of loaded fat on top of insurance premium. And so by joining a captive, you're just taking that, that piece of pie that, that's going to be dedicated towards insurance premium, and you're reducing it even more. If you're fully insured, it's the entire pie that's that's fully insured insurance premium. If you're self-funded, you've reduced it more. If you're self-funded a captive, you're getting more control over those dollars. More control means you're you're reducing the inefficiencies of, of buying insurance. So, you know, concept number one, does it give you more control over the dollars? And the answer is it absolutely does that and I think that's that's popularity that's that's why it's leading to, to becoming really such a, a such a common play now for employers does it help mitigate risk that does does participating the captive that's the concept it will help you mitigate risk and the answer that we're seeing is it's it's absolutely yes when we stack up our traditional stop loss results against our captive results we see better results in terms of trend in terms of claims on a frequency and severity basis we're seeing all that is that because they're participating in a captive? No, it's because of what employers do when they participate in a captive. They're more engaged, they have skin in the game, they're more educated, they collaborate more, and therefore their results are better. And so that secondary concept is, does it help us mitigate risk? And we're, without question, we can show that, that it, it, it does that for sure. And so there's another reason why I think things are taken off. And then it's, does it reduce volatility? We, we believe in self-funding. We believe in all the advantages of self-funding, but we're concerned about the peaks and valleys of being buying stop loss on our own out in the marketplace. So does a captive help us reduce the volatility of being self-funded? And as, as Jeff showed on, on that slide, and we, we'll show for every program we have, and we're, we're ecstatic about what that results would tell us, is that yes, it absolutely reduces the volatility of being self-funded. In the, in the traditional stop loss space, you're your spectrum of increases are, are way out here. And in the captive space, we, we see that compressed down. So you've got control over dollars, you're mitigating the risks and doing a great job to manage it. You're benefiting from that, from the efforts you're putting in place. And you've got that, that protection and reduced volatility uh, that allows you to continue to manage and self-fund your plan. You put that all together and now we've got, you know, concepts are no longer concepts, they are reality. And that's why I think this space is really taken off the way it's taking off and why more and more employers are, are heading in, in this direction. There's also a lot of questions in regards to 
no new laser rate caps and everything. Absolutely, do we have those in place? Do we have 45 different programs? Is it in unison by pro? And no, it's by program. It consultant and has a conversation with underwriting Berkeley as to what is appropriate for said program. Um, gene and cell therapy, the tsunami that's coming our way, are we involved in that? Uh, you bet. Is, is that we are we're on the front line of that conversation and trying to determine impact on our captive programs for the foresee for now for the foreseeable future as to how we you know get our arms around that absolutely no doubt about it yeah I love your comment Mike on no laser rate cap I mean the way to think about it is Ber Berkeley has a no laser rate cap product it's an endorsement it's the actual filed part of the policy it's an insurance protection um, buy that from Berkeley and buy that while you're participating in the captive. And now you've got this, this incredible two-layered protection. You've got a, an actual endorsement policy. It's not a promise or a philosophy. It's an actual endorsement that protects you from a worst-case scenario, rate cap with no lasers. And you're also participating in the captive that reduces that volatility naturally by, by the scale of the captive. So that's a really great one-two punch for, for self-funded employers. And from, from our point of view, it's the right way to go. And just really quick, right, guys, start. that was fantastic. Oh, Donald. Hey, I was going to say, and got. for for RBP group specifically, it it allows you to communicate more openly with your reinsurer because in the traditional market, what what's your what's your what's your course of action when there's a large rate increase? Stop it. What's your course of action in a captive? Discuss risk management over time. Which one's going to turn out better? Communication. So it's just a different way of looking at it. Good point. So we are running out of time. There's a whole bunch of great questions in here. I think what we'll try and do if uh, the team at Berkeley is open to it is get the questions to them. We can put the answers together and then send it out with the follow-up. Um, and, and hopefully everyone's okay with that. So don't stop asking questions uh, on these fireside chats. We just had more than we could get to today. Uh, with that, let's go to the closing uh, piece here. One, uh, Next slide, we got the, the Berkeley guys. Uh, so if you want to reach out to them, ask these questions to them directly, feel free. Greatly appreciate you guys coming on. Fantastic job, as always. Um, enjoyed the time spent with you and look forward to the next time we see each other in person. Um, my contact information, you can just go on through that and get to the end of this thing. To the last slide, which is promoting uh, next month's fireside chat. So this will be for June. Uh, we now have uh, Emma Fox joining us. So 